Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for Concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting, Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. And welcome to Concord Matters, the show where we seek to be of one mind, that is the mind of Christ, and to do that, Christ confessing Concordians confer with the Book of Concord to conform what we believe, teach, and confess according to Scripture in our Lutheran Confession of the Faith. On today's show, we're going to discuss why Concord matters for adiaphora, or different things, in worship. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Dual Parish of Emmanuel West Point and St. Paul's Wine Hill in Southern Illinois. And my companion confessors in conversation about this matter today are Chaplain Sean Denzer. He's the Director of Worship for the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and Chaplain for the International Center of the LCMS in St. Louis, Missouri. And Pastor Larry Bean, he is the pastor of Salem Lutheran Church in Gretna, Louisiana. Chaplain Denzer, welcome back to Concord Matters. Great to be back with you, Sean. And Pastor Bean, we're honored to welcome you to Concord Matters today. Well, thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. Yes, definitely great to have both of you in for this conversation. Of course, the last couple of weeks we've been going with Chaplain Denzer through this kind of little series within a series, looking at the confessional principles that inform our worship life together as Lutheran Christians. And today we come to something that Chaplain Denzer previewed just a little bit for us last week, and we wanted to bring Pastor Bean in for his thoughts and wealth of knowledge on this matter as well. And that's matters of adiaphora. And last week we were talking about matters of reverence and worship, and we previewed there that there is a certain amount of Christian freedom when it comes to the matters and the things, if you will, of our Lutheran worship together. We can have a little bit of Christian liberty or Christian freedom, and we'll see some differences in those things. However, I think one of the things in kind of setting this up that a lot of times people just assume maybe or have as their thinking that because we as Lutherans uphold that there are matters of adiaphora, which we'll talk about and define that terminology here as we get going in just a second. But as we affirm that, I think sometimes people just assume that, well, you're free to do whatever you want. And sometimes we'll even commonly hear, you do what's right for your context. And this matter for me really early on in my pastoral ministry became something really important to wrestle with because I was doing college ministry and I remember talking to one of my college students who was actually frustrated because she grew up in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and her home church had customs and practices and how they conducted their worship services that they said, quote unquote, fit their circumstances there. And then she went off to college, still within the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, but wasn't seeing the same thing. She said, it's really confusing. And I don't know what to do with that, that I'm still within the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, but things are so different. It feels like I'm in different church bodies almost. And so I think that's going to be kind of important for us to wrestle with here too, especially as we're calling this Concord Matters. So agreement in that Christian confession, Concord Matters for Adiaphora. How do we handle this? The fact that we can have some Christian liberty, some different things, but yet we want Concord and we're striving for Concord. And so I guess maybe a good place to start is with defining some of our terms here. And Chaplain Denzer, I'm going to start with you as you've previewed this for us. And then uh, we'll also get Pastor Bean in here as well. Go ahead and give us some definitions, maybe even just starting with the term adiaphora. Sure. Even before that, I think there's another term that's a lot simpler, and it's where this question of adiaphora comes in. And that's the confessor's definition of the church itself back in Augsburg Confession, Article 7. It says this, For the true unity of the church, it's enough to agree about the doctrine of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. It's not necessary that human traditions, that is, rites or ceremonies instituted by men, should be the same everywhere. So it's setting up a distinction right away that the essence of the church is the preaching, the administration of the sacraments. It's not necessarily what you're looking at. 
That being said, we introduce a whole lot of things immediately that come to our mind when we think of church that are not the essence of the church. And it's most of what our eyes get to see, except for really the bread and what our ears actually hear, the words themselves, which are preached. And all of these things then fall into this category of adiaphora. What does that word mean? From Greek diaphorein, which means to separate, to distinguish, or to make a difference. Thus, adiaphora are things that don't make a difference. Sometimes it's translated as indifferent things. It's important to, I think, bring in the German word for this too, which is mitteldinge, and that translates really easily into English, middle things. Why are they in the middle? Because they're neither commanded nor forbidden by God. There are lots of things God has said, don't do murder. You're not free to discuss the merits of murder. God said, no, don't. There are things he commanded us to do, pray. So you're not free to say, well, I don't think I feel like praying, uh, and that's my choice. Just doesn't work for me. It doesn't work in my context. No, you don't have that choice. It's not in the middle at all. But there are a great many things surrounding those essential commands and prohibitions from God that do stand in the middle. They're not commanded by God, you have to do this or you won't go to heaven. And they're not forbidden by God, you have to avoid this, otherwise I'm sending you to hell. That's what we're talking about today with this word adiaphora. And the tough part is the Greek word, especially when we bring it in English as indifferent things, runs into a range of meaning that is troublesome, right? It's one thing to say, is this the essence or not? Is this what true worship is? Faith, the preaching of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. Or is this something that surrounds and holds up and emphasizes that? Or do we mean indifferent in the sense of it really doesn't matter, it is of no consequence at all, it has no effect on anything, and we can literally do whatever we want with no connection to anyone else or anything else? And I think we're going to argue as we we look at what the confessions have to say, it certainly can't be that latter thing. Because especially when it comes to our neighbors, our fellow Christians, or maybe even more importantly, those who disagree with us, there's where we have to be very clear in what we do as well. And even though those things are not things commanded or forbidden by God on which our salvation hangs, the doing of them really makes a difference for our confession and what we're saying to others, that we would be clear, that we wouldn't be talking out of one side of our mouth with some people and out of the other side of our mouth with others. Because as it turns out, the act of confessing really happens in these not commanded, not forbidden things of God. The things that humans have instituted, these adiaphora. Pastor Bean, do you have anything to add to that or further thoughts for us? Yeah, you know, I was kind of reflecting on the term adiaphora, and in a sense, it's kind of an unfortunate term. When we say neither commanded by the scriptures nor prohibited by the scriptures, we don't really have a word for that. So we use adiaphora, and an adiaphoron is, as Pastor Denzer said, an indifferent thing. It's literally something that makes no difference. And so we've kind of used this word along with the idea that the Scripture neither commands nor prohibits something. But the problem is with that, there's a lot of things that the Scripture neither commands nor prohibits. And if you equate that as the definition of an adiaphoron, it can very easily slip to anything goes. And I think it's interesting when you read, especially the Formula of Concord, Article 10, when you read the Epitome and the Solid Declaration, both, they're kind of careful. They define an adiaphoron initially as something that's neither commanded nor prohibited by the scriptures. But that's like the top of the flow chart. If something is commanded by scripture or something is prohibited by scripture, it is not an adiaphoron. But there are other tests as well. There are other sub-definitions that can kick it out, can kick something out to be an adiaphoron or not an adiaphoron. And that's where the devil's in the details, where you have to look further down beyond just is scripture commanding this or prohibiting it. But that does bring in the situation, the specific context And in our Lutheran history, we found this out very quickly through the various controversies, the adiaphoristic controversy, the interims and so forth that were placed upon the Lutherans. And they had to hash all this stuff out. And like I said, I think the word adiaphoron, it's actually a very old Greek word. In a sense, I think the word is a little bit incomplete and it's required us to narrow down the definition and it gets a little complicated. It gets a little bit like nailing jello to the wall because we are wrestling with, on the one hand, Christian liberty, but we're also wrestling with the idea of good order. And sometimes there's a little bit of a gray area there. 
Yeah, I completely agree. And maybe sometimes I would even say one of the struggles that we have is much like we see some Christians even approach the Bible with is is that we have kind of our preconceived ideas about what things are. And so then we approach something and we try to read into that. Well, this is just an Adi offering, right? It's an indifferent matter. And so we have this freedom here. When instead, what we want to do is, I agree, we have this progression of how do we reason out these things. And I think that's sometimes left off in a lot of our considerations in the church, unfortunately, is that we don't really reason things out. We just do things sometimes. And so part of what we want to do with this show today is begin to provide a process for us to reason this out. What are some of the steps? What are some of the considerations that we want to take? And I think, again, this is really important picking up again in the little progression of what we've been doing with this show, especially with this little mini series of how we talk about our Christian worship together, that Concord Matters for Worship, that as we looked at reverence and what is reverence in the church last week, of course, that's centered in faith, but there is a little bit of room for disagreement. I remember Chaplain Denzer last week giving us a couple examples of some things that the Lutherans have historically had some differences in the way that they have conducted their services very reverently, but some different things that were behind that. Uh, We talked about the elevation of the host as a couple examples that were given to us last week, but maybe is that a good place to go ahead and begin our reasoning through this? How we approach this then is where is the place that we can consider that room for disagreement, that Christian liberty? Yeah, that might be helpful for our viewers, or our listeners rather, to have two places in their hands in the Book of Concord. They're both Article 10X of the Formula of Concord. But remember, the Formula of Concord has two versions. The Epitome, that's the short version, usually is printed first. And the Solid Declaration, that's the long version, the technical version. And I think it'll probably be good for us to bounce back and forth between the two of them. So if you want to stick your bookmarks in, then you'll be caught up with us. All right, so let's go ahead and start then with at least the definition of this, of church practices, which is Article 10 from the Solid Declaration of the Formula of Concord. And again, on this show, we use the Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions, a reader's edition of the Book of Concord, available to you from Concordia Publishing House, a publishing arm of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod. And this is picking up with paragraph 8 and 9 of Article 10 of Church Practices from the Solid Declaration of the Formula of Concord. Regarding genuine adiaphora, or matters of indifference, as explained before, we believe, teach, and confess the following. Such ceremonies in and of themselves are not worship of God, nor any part of it. They must be properly distinguished from ceremonies that are. As it is written, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And that's Matthew 15, verse 9. We believe, teach, and confess that the community of God in every place and every time has, according to its circumstances, the good right, power, and authority to change and decrease or increase ceremonies that are truly adiaphora. They should do this thoughtfully and without giving offense in an orderly and appropriate way whenever it is considered most profitable, most beneficial, and best for good order, Christian discipline, and the church's edification. Furthermore, we can yield and give in with a good conscience to the weak in faith in such outward adiaphora. Paul teaches this in Romans 14 and proves it by his example. See Acts 16, 3, 21, 26, and 1 Corinthians 9, 19. So we said that there is room for some disagreement among Christians, or maybe that is to say to either do things differently or to discuss, change, come to a new conclusion, and otherwise modify these things because they're not commanded. Like we mentioned, you're not free to give up on prayer. You're not free to say, the Lord's Supper, take it or leave it because the Lord's commanded it. But there's so many things, especially ceremonial things, particular rites, the specific song that we're singing this Sunday, that we change our opinion about, that we argue for or against, and that we come to conclusions, consensus, and have traditions that we use. And these are allowed to be different. It's interesting. Some people are frustrated by the fact that pastors, that Christians in general, would ever argue about these adiaphora, these things that are not commanded or forbidden by God. You know, we should major in the majors and and not major in the minors. Keep the main thing the main thing. That really is good advice. But it's a little different when the main things have been commanded by God or forbidden by God. And the rest of the things, which frankly, occupies the most of our time and and occupies the most of our wisdom are these middle things, these adiaphora. 
it turns out these are the perfect things to argue about in a way. They're the only things we're allowed to argue about. There's no arguing about what is commanded by God. His word tells us we obey it. You don't get to argue with God and say, oh, I don't know, you might want to rethink that, Lord. Same thing with the things he's commanded. We say, amen, we're going to keep these. We're going to preach them. We're going to teach them to our children. No questions asked. All these other things is, in fact, the place where we have to use our reason, our arguments, our discussion, our consideration of other people, our love to even perhaps give them up or change something for the sake of a weaker brother. This is where arguments, discussions, and reason have to come in. That's why we have all these words like thoughtfully, appropriate, considered, what is profitable, what contributes to good order, what has concern for the weak in consciences, right, for those who are weak in faith. All of this outward stuff is precisely the place where we have to think about it. And, and there's where, as uh, Pastor Bean said, indifferent, at least as that strikes our ears, is maybe not the best choice because it implies pointless, reasonless, meaningless. And there's a lot of meaning and thought behind what goes on here. And if it should have to change for our time, there's going to be even more thought. There is a lot of scandal. Of course, some people do try to argue with God's word. As you said, we really can't there. <laughs> He's God. He gets to say. But there is, I think, a way in which in our Christian freedom, we can argue and argument can be done in Christian love and respect for one another. But these aren't unimportant things. These are matters that we can have some differences in. And so, Pastor Bean, I don't think I'm being unkind here towards you or anything, but anyone who follows you on social media and some of the things that you write and so forth knows that you definitely don't shy away from having arguments. Again, I think they're respectful and beneficial for the church myself. That's why I invite you on my show. But you certainly don't shy away from having those sorts of debates and discussions about these matters of how we conduct ourselves in worship. So I'm interested on in your thoughts here in reflection to what Chaplain Denzer just set up for us. Yeah, you know, theology is, a lot of it is kind of debate-driven. Scripture says, iron sharpening iron. And of course, pastors are men, and men have a bit of a competitive streak, and we argue. And, you know, as even as boys on the playground, as we all know, we would get into scrapes and maybe have a little bit of a fisticuffs, and then afterwards we shake hands and walk away as friends. But again, the point is to try to get to the best answer. And the matters that are adiaphora, those, again, those are the things that we can debate about. We certainly can't debate about something that is a settled matter in Scripture. And there's a lot of judgment calls, a lot of discernment that's called for by pastors, by congregations, and in various situations that we find ourselves. Again, in paragraph nine, we say, yes, we can change our ceremonies, but look at how many restrictions there are that we say. We have to be careful not to give offense. We don't want thoughtlessness. We want it to be in an orderly, becoming way, the most profitable, beneficial, and best for preserving good order. You know, that's a lot of kind of conditions for something that we almost tend to treat as anything goes. It's not anything goes. It's that there are plenty of things that the Lord leaves to our discretion as pastors, as congregations, as church bodies. We can make judgment calls on things, but never at the expense of order, never at the expense of reverence, never at the expense of what is beneficial to the saints. And those are things that we can debate about. Those are things that we can have differences of opinion about. And it may well be that in one congregation, one decision gets made, in another congregation, another decision gets made. And if it's truly an adiaphoran, then that's fine. And that shouldn't be something that divides us in terms of fellowship. But there are situations, I don't know if now's a good time to introduce it, but if we pop up to paragraph seven, when if you're dealing with something that's useless a foolish display, something that's not profitable for good order or Christian discipline or evangelical propriety, then the adiaphora card is off the table. You don't get to say, well, this is an adiaphora. So this does leave room for discernment when we determine, okay, if we're going to introduce a ceremony or we're going to remove a ceremony or we're going to alter something in our worship, there may be a very good reason for doing it, but there may not be. The reason may be because our culture is very entertainment driven and we want people to laugh and have fun while they're in church. That's not a very good reason for playing the adiaphora card. And in fact, what paragraph seven says, that is not 
an adiaphoron when it involves frivolity or something of that nature. So to reiterate what Pastor Denzer was saying, these are the kinds of things that we theologians need to butt heads about, and we need to not be shy about it. And hopefully at the end of the day, we come to a, a happy consensus, and the things that are truly adiaphora, we live with. But things that are not, we shouldn't allow to just slip down that slippery slope and call it an adiaphora when it isn't beneficial to the church. Well said. And just so nobody's confused because we've used the word argument, which in our day tends to sound like we're fighting or having a, you know, we're going to punch each other. Argument here also includes simply a reasoned argument, a line of thinking and an explanation for why we're doing something, a rationale for it. And I think we see this actually in some of the negative statements at the end of this article, if you want to jump in solid declaration to paragraph 30. We see two things. We reject and condemn abolishing these adiaphora as though the community of God at any time and place in any land was not free to use one or more ceremonies in Christian liberty according to its circumstances as may be most useful to the church. You see how they're considering what their context invites, what their congregation and circumstances are, and thus choosing to make use of these ceremonies, not to get rid of them. And then the last paragraph, 31, the churches will not condemn one another because of differences in ceremonies when, in Christian liberty, one has more or less of them, right? It's not about piling them up and comparing with one another as if it were just boys, you know, comparing who's taller, who's wider, something like that. This applies as long as they are otherwise agreed with one another in the doctrine and all of its articles, also in the right use of the holy sacraments. This fits with the well-known saying, disagreement in fasting does not destroy agreement in faith. And with that last paragraph, we're back to the definition of the church I gave at the beginning of this session, right? The preaching and the administration of the sacraments is the essential thing. Thus, the real adiaphora that we want to be concerned with are what attends that preaching and that administration of the sacrament rightly. And we're not going to judge one another on those, but we are going to make judgments that are wise for the sake of upholding what is the true thing. Yes, and I wanted to jump in. This paragraph 31, I guess, it mentions Christian liberty. And I think maybe one way that I like to kind of think of it is the difference between uniformity and unity. I think there are two opposite extremes. You know, in the military, you wear a uniform because everybody is dressed exactly the same way, right down to the buttons. That's uniformity. And then on the other extreme from uniformity, where everything is exactly the same, would be chaos, where nothing's the same. Everybody's doing their own thing, and there's nothing to sort of bind everybody together. But I think going along with the German word Mitteldingen, you know, there's a middle way between uniformity, which is always legalistic and enforced, has to be forced on people, versus chaos, which we don't want, which is a bad thing, which you can't have in worship, which Paul specifically says not to have in the Christian congregation for worship. And what we really want, we're after is unity. And unity is not uniformity, but unity is not chaos. And so I think in striving for unity, we want something that there's a similarity, there's a commonality, there's a communion. It doesn't have to be exactly the same like a military uniform, but certainly we don't want this just chaos of anything goes, one church that uses a liturgy and another church that uses no liturgy at all. And in striving for unity, I think that this discussion about adiaphora and this whole struggle that the church had to go through historically that brought us to Article 10, I really think what we're after is unity. Which I think then is a good transition for us to the next step as we look at this reasoning out is to look at how we seek that unity then centered on the confession of the faith once again, which is something that we'll have to pick up on the other side of the break. You're listening to Concord Matters on KFUO. Cross Defense is the show where we talk about curious topics to excite the imagination, equip the mind, and comfort the soul with God's Word. Join me, Pastor Tyrell Bramwell, every Monday at 2 p.m. Central on KFUO Radio, or anytime on KFUO.org, or even your favorite podcast app. My friends, our foe is a fierce enemy. Our only defense is Christ on the cross.
welcome back to Concord Matters as we continue talking about Concord Matters or Adiaphora or different things in our Christian worship together. And we continue talking with Chaplain Sean Denzer and Pastor Larry Bean. And in the first half of the show, we were setting up that it's okay to have arguments about these things. As a matter of fact, I almost want to say that when we use our reason, which is a first article gift, it's actually a God-pleasing thing, right? That we would use our reason and all our senses that God gives us as we have these discussions. Of course, we want to cover them with respect and Christian love. But as we try to formulate the way that we have these reasoned discussions, what are the things that we want to consider? We see that we have some room for disagreement. We can argue about these things and what some of those things are that can be argued about and have some differences in. We talked about that in the first half and then already saw some things that we really ought not have disagreement in. But then as you left us there just before the break, Pastor Bean, that the goal is to confess the faith and to seek unity. And I often share this story. I've brought this up on this radio show several times, but I realize not everyone listens every week. And so maybe you haven't heard this before. And I only have five stories, so I'm going to tell it again. But as I once upon a time worked in the secular world for a chain restaurant, I thought it was really interesting there how they wanted unity in their practices so much so that they actually had quality control people that came in that made sure that we were having unity in our practices. They would actually even intentionally move us around to different stores and locations so that we would work with people that we weren't familiar with and in the surroundings that they were basically the same. And that actually was really beneficial, especially for the customer as they would come into those stores They knew how to order. They knew how to act. They knew what to do. And it was a very comforting thing. And the business world has long known this. I mean, Starbucks, McDonald's, all of them operate on this principle, and it's very effective for them. And I think in the church, we have certainly had that historically, but then we've, especially in our modern context, kind of drifted away from that and gone to rampant individualism where everybody just kind of does their own thing. And I don't know that it's truly a building for us. And so as we seek unity, give us some principles of how we can do that, how we can find and recover once again, that which even the business world acknowledges is of great benefit. So where do we want to jump into then as we start to look for unity in our Christian confession when it comes to matters of different things in worship? Well, yeah, unity in the church, as we covered in Article 7 of the Augsburg Confession, speaks in light of the one holy church. And then we mentioned the true unity of the church being found in the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. And because that is where we find our unity, that's why we don't need uniformity in our ceremonies. But having said that, of course, a ceremony is essentially a a means of communication that is nonverbal. So you can say the same thing in different ways. But nonverbal communication is just as important as verbal communication. And the way that you carry yourself, your gestures, your ceremonies, your ritual actions, the vestments, the use of color in the church, the use of art in the church. We do want to send a unified message, even if it's not uniformity. We do want to proclaim the gospel with unity, and art and ritual and ceremony and reverence and gestures are all a big part of that. So it's, again, on the one hand, you have total chaos. On the other hand, you have absolute sameness. But there really is a middle ground with that where we can observe unity in our ceremonies. I think one great example of that is having the same hymnal. For a long, long time, the churches used the TLH. And then when we went to the LW, there was some dissension on that. And we had LW churches and we had TLH churches. And that really hurt the sense of unity because we're singing different hymns. We're using different liturgies. And it did create friction and a sense of disunity. But now with LSB being predominant, we pretty much have restored that kind of unity in the hymnal. And if we can just get all of our churches to actually use it, we still do have some elements of chaos there. But again, that's just really what I wanted to go with, the idea of, as Pastor Smith said, even in the business world, they see value in having something you can rely on. You know, how sad it is when people will say they're going to go on vacation somewhere and they want to go to an LCMS church, but they don't know whether they can really go to the LCMS church because you don't know what you're going to get. It's like Forrest Gump's box of chocolates, you know, 
having unity is a great blessing because if you go to a church you have never been to in your life, you know there's going to be an altar, a font, a pulpit, you know there's going to be the invocation, you know there's going to be the sermon hymn, you know that the pastor's going to be wearing the vestments and, and colors of the church year are going to be communicated just like they were in your home church. And there's great comfort in that, and especially for young people, for children being brought up in the faith. To be able to see that unity, that common confession of the gospel, both in what we say and in what we do. A hearty amen to that. Just as I have two young children, one a toddler, the other an infant, so not quite into this stage yet, but especially with our toddler, we have learned the great benefit of routine. Children thrive off a of routine, actually. And just when we have that kind of unity, even in our home devotional life, that is liturgical. He knows what comes next, which is true generally in the day. And those are the much happier days for a toddler. It is chaos when the routine is upset <laughs> with a toddler at home. <laughs> Chaplain Denzer, who has more children than I do, uh, certainly knows that as well. And Pastor Bean, you know that we all know that, uh, anyone who spent time around children. All right, so go ahead and give us some confessional principles on this then. Well, tranquility, if you can get that in your pew, you're a blessed family. That's also what the confessions say about these church ceremonies. In Article 15 of the Augsburg Confession, it says that our churches teach that ceremonies ought to be observed that may be observed without sin. Also, ceremonies and other practices that are profitable for tranquility and good order in the church. They give a few examples, in particular, holy days that be set festivals of the church year and the like. They ought to be observed. And yet our people are taught, notice there's some teaching that goes along with these ceremonies, that consciences are not to be burdened as though observing them was necessary for salvation. And in fact, anything that's instituted contrary to God's word, like something instituted to merit God's grace by doing it, that would actually be useless and contrary to the gospel, they say. So you see, again, probably doing something that is not commanded or forbidden in the Bible is a necessity. It'd be impossible to do only the things commanded and to not do only the things forbidden. I mean, just try it. You're going to immediately find something where you won't know the answer from the Bible, and you're going to have to come up with something, right? Thankfully, we don't have to do this in isolation. We've got a long history in the church. We have a lot of great fathers and a lot of other Christians that have been through this territory before, and we care what they had to say. So that leads us to say, for example, in Article 21, where we're kind of wrapping up the doctrines and talking about a few other abuses that are more ceremonial in the church. We say, our churches do not dissent from any article of faith held by the church Catholic. We only omit some of the newer abuses that were erroneously accepted through the corruption of the times. And at the end of it, they said something that we talked about last week. It can easily be judged that if the churches observe ceremonies correctly, think about everything we talked about in the previous weeks, you know, where faith in Christ is being proclaimed through them. We're pointing to the Word of God, where we're administering His sacraments according to His institution in a right way. If we were to do all those things, all of the dignity of those ceremonies would be maintained, the reverence and the piety of church, it would increase among the people. This would be a real success. And that's the kind of unity in uniformity that we're after. This is something that's right in the Missouri Synod Constitution, in fact that we strive for some uniformity. And I believe that's the word that's used actually in our worship ceremony. That was there from the very beginning of the Missouri Synod. It's still in our constitution today. You know, not demanding this as something that is a penalty that affects your salvation, but this is something that's desirable in the church for the sake of tranquility. And that's so when you go into a church, you'll recognize even before you listen to what's going on, hopefully what to expect in the preaching as well which I think is a great transition, by the way, into the topic we've been hinting at and really need to cover in depth, which is this adiaphoristic controversy, which really does the pushback that Pastor Bean has been doing on all of this. These matters are indifferent, right? They don't make a difference. Well, sometimes they do. Yeah, and especially, I think, connecting in with what you said, it, it's in our LCMS constitution, right, is that we do strive for this uniformity and a lot of these confessions have come out of controversies, and there certainly was controversy in the early church. We see this with the American Lutheran Church, uh, especially the groups settled in the Northeast and so forth, that they were trying to look very American. And so we're drifting away from especially the Augsburg Confession and kind of having a loose association with that. 
And for Walther and the ones who settled in Missouri, they were centered on confessing the faith from connection with the Lutheran confessions. Yes. In fact, that's part of our Missouri Synod Constitution that has fallen out. And I think I know why, because it uses kind of a technical term that isn't something we use every day. But it used to say that churches are not supposed to be using the new measures. What are new measures? It was a technical term back then for what Charles Finney and the revivalists were doing. They had said things so bold as baptism was Jesus' way of doing things, but that's kind of a passe, antiquated practice. Baptism just doesn't win souls anymore. Now we need tent revivals. That's the way God's working today. An astounding thing to say that God's own institution has passed its prime or something. But this was the kind of confession that ended up coming into the Missouri Synod Constitution, even so much as to use the phrase new measures, talking, yeah, about these adiaphora, but saying even though they're matters that ought to be indifferent, the fact that some people have made them very different, very important, so far as even to say that they would affect the way people hear the gospel, that they would be either more effective or less effective to win souls, that even baptism might have to take second fiddle to these new measures. That's how suddenly these in and of themselves adiaphora become not adiaphora, but something that we actually have to take a little bit of a stand on and and insist on something. So I think if our listeners want to go to Formula of Concord, let's look at the solid declaration and we'll jump back a little bit and then we'll go forward. So first look at paragraph five of solid declaration, article 10. All right, so let's go ahead and take paragraph five then of Article 10, which again is of church practices, which we read from earlier. And it says, under the title and excuse of outward adiaphora, things are proposed that are in principle contrary to God's word, although painted another color. These ceremonies are not to be regarded as adiaphora, in which one is free to do as he wants. They must be avoided as things prohibited by God. In a similar way, in such a situation, ceremony should not be regarded as genuine free adiaphora or matters of indifference. This is because they make a show or pretend that our religion and that of the papists are not far apart in order to avoid persecution, or they pretend that the papist ceremonies are not at least highly offensive to us. When ceremonies are intended for this purpose and are required and received as through them contrary religions are reconciled and became one body, we cannot regard them as adiaphora. When returning to the papacy and departing from the gospel's pure doctrine and true religion should happen or gradually follow from such ceremonies, we cannot regard them as adiaphora. Yeah, this is very interesting because, you know, oftentimes people will say what's really important about the Book of Concord is the doctrine. And as long as we all have the same doctrine, the ceremonies, the practices, the ritual, the liturgy, none of that really matters. You can do whatever you want to do. But this part of our confession makes it very clear that our ceremonies do matter. So in that sense, these are not indifferent things, especially under the circumstances where you are being persecuted or where you are being asked to say that your faith is no different than this other faith. In other words, when the doctrine is being questioned, it's at those particular times when the ceremonies cease being in different things, and the ceremonies become an actual confession of faith. I had a pastor a long time ago argue that Article 24 of the Augsburg Confession and the Apology were no longer binding upon us. And I was thinking to myself, my goodness, Melanchthon and the early confessors wrote an entire article on the Mass, on worship, and it was filled with not just the theology of worship, but the doctrinal practice of how we conduct worship. And the doctrine and the practice go hand in hand, and just like we were reflecting on the review of the abuses actually says, in doctrine and ceremonies, the two words are linked closely together. And along these lines, you know, sometimes people will argue that, well, the doctrine is what's important. The practice really doesn't matter because the doctrine is prescriptive and the practice is simply descriptive. So, for instance, in Article 24, in the Apology, Article 24 at the beginning, when it says, we do not abolish the Mass, but religiously keep and defend it. In our churches, Mass is celebrated every Sunday and on other festivals when the sacrament is offered to those who wish for it after they have been examined and absolved. We keep traditional liturgical forms, such as the order of the lessons, prayers, vestments, etc. 
And some people would say, well, yes, but all of that is just adiaphora, you know, vestments, not vestments, every Sunday communion, not every Sunday communion. None of that really is binding. None of that really matters because that's not a prescriptive. That's simply descriptive of what these Lutherans are doing at that snapshot in time, but it's no longer relevant to us. And it dawned on me that to read with a hermeneutic of prescriptive, descriptive, to sort of take two markers and go through your book of Concord and say this is prescriptive and this is descriptive is really an incorrect hermeneutic. Because what are the Lutheran confessions? They're confessions of faith. And that can't be prescriptive. You can't compel faith. You either believe it or you don't. So even the Nicene Creed is not prescriptive. It's simply a description of the faith of those who hold the Nicene Creed. If you don't believe the Nicene Creed, you're not a Christian. You might be an Arian. You might be a member of another heretical group. But if you believe what we believe, then you are one of us. And it creates sort of a boundary around what the church is. And our Lutheran confessions serve the same purpose. If you believe what we believe, then this describes your doctrine and this describes your practice because the practice and the doctrine and ceremonies go hand in hand together. And so if you look at the Book of Concord, not as prescriptive, like the bylaws of synod are prescriptive, right? There are certain things pastors have to fill out certain forms every year, and congregations must pay certain fees, and if you don't do it, there's going to be a punishment. That is prescription, right? The Book of Concord doesn't read that way. It just simply says, we believe, teach, and confess. That's what we do. It describes what we believe. It describes what we teach, it describes what we confess, and it describes our doctrine and our ceremonies. And of course, there's leeway, there's room for some variation for good reason and within the confines of true adiaphora. But when something is not a true adiaphoron, we must not take that for license to do whatever we want to do. A good question for a congregation maybe should read the Book of Concord together and say, hey, does this Book of Concord describe what our church looks like? Do we take every Sunday communion? Because that's what it says. We celebrate the Mass every Sunday and on other festivals. Do we do that? And if we don't do that, maybe we need to conform our practice to that description of what a Lutheran church looks like. I love that so much. I mean, to ask that question of, does this describe what we look like? Because that's what gets into this trouble of the controversy. In terms of the history, this is after Luther had died, Melanchthon has kind of become the heir apparent to the movement or the figurehead of Lutheranism. But the real problem is the princes are gathering the wagons because the emperor and his Spanish troops are coming in to attack the German territories to take back this land for the Roman Catholic Church by force. Hard for us to understand that today, I know, in America. But that's what was going on. We promptly lost our big battle right away. We had no hope against the emperor's troop. And it's time to make terms. And and when you're on the loser, you're not in an arguing position. Melanchthon is the one who makes the kind of theological concessions here. And he makes concessions on this principle that the faith and the church has to do with what's internal. And everything that's external then, with our body, with our actions, ceremonies, for example, that is the state's concern. That's the emperor, this world's concern. And that led him in his discussions with the Roman Catholics as they're bringing us back into the emperor's control. You know, what concessions can we make with our Roman Catholic opponents to give up almost everything on the ceremonies side, to accept practices that not only looked like they were Roman Catholic, but also that expressed the teaching that was Roman Catholic too. And you see that hint at the end of what you read there from paragraph 5, right? When returning to the papacy and departing from the gospel's pure doctrine and true religion should happen or gradually follow from such ceremonies, we cannot regard them as adiaphora. It's a funny thing, and everybody's noticed this. We are not always disciplined to listen carefully, to listen for the doctrine, to understand the arguments, to follow things to their conclusions and say, does this make sense? Turns out doctrine is hard. It doesn't, shouldn't discourage us from doing things like listening to this radio program, reading these confessions, improving ourselves, giving a rip about it, right? I mean, this is the Lord's own word. This is important. But we all get lazy, and then we just go by appearances. In fact, that's all the more reason to make sure our appearances help people out. If they're being lazy and all they're doing is paying attention with the external stuff, does it still point them back to the right thing? That's what we want, right? So that even when you get lazy and distracted in church, you're no longer looking at the altar or the pastor and you're gazing out the windows. 
well, shoot, pretty soon I see pictures of Christ and telling the Bible stories again, and, and my attention, shame on me, is brought back to the right thing. That's a good use of those windows to put those pictures there. But what if you start looking around and being a little lazy, not paying attention clearly to what's going on, and you started realizing that all the stuff was pointing you in the wrong direction? That's what would have happened if you were living in these re-Romanized territories, these formerly Lutheran territories that had been taken over by the emperor's troops that had now made these concessions to the Roman Catholics, that they're carrying around Jesus Christ on Corpus Christi Sunday, his body throughout the territory, and they're not eating it or drinking it for the forgiveness of sins like Jesus instituted, and all sorts of other things that went along with it reintroducing things that had been abandoned because of their connection with the false teaching. That's when it no longer is an adiaphora, when it gives the impression and the appearance of being united with those that we are not united with. Or to put it in Pastor Bean's fantastic terms, when you would look at this service and you would say, I would describe this as a service of another church. Or I would look at this and say, there is no difference. And making those concessions, in fact, so we don't have to have the difficult work of having an argument with somebody that we don't agree with. But instead, just making it look like all Christian denominations, or even Christians and non-Christians, we're all praying, right? No big deal. Daniel 6 is a fantastic example of this. Daniel, you'll remember, this is right before the lion's den, right? And the command is made in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Everybody's got to bow down to the statue where they blow all the instruments and stuff. And Daniel does a funny thing. He, he doesn't care. He's still going to pray to his God. He does it in front of his window in the upper room. And everybody sees him and says, look, there's Daniel praying, right? He's one of those Hebrews, right? Worshiping that false God. He should be worshiping you, O king. And Daniel refuses to stop doing that. Now, look, praying at a certain time, praying in front of your window, his usual practice, Is that an adiaphora? I suppose he could have made that argument, right? Well, I can just pray after these 30 days are over, or I can just pray at night when nobody's watching me. But he knew that the force of that law was not just to inconvenience him a little bit, but it actually was to say, who's the real king? Who's the real God here? It's Nebuchadnezzar. And he knew that even though the time and the place of his prayer was not that important, in this case, he had to make the right confession. And then he had to suffer the consequences, which, as we know, was to be thrown to the lions, which should have meant death for him, except as even Nebuchadnezzar started to realize, your God probably can deliver you, or let's hope he can. Turns out, of course he can. And that's what was going on here. In fact, it's very interesting how this town of Magdeburg, in particular a layman named Matthias Flacius, stood up for the right side on this. They recognized that this was especially harmful to the laity to make an agreement behind closed doors, to change all the ceremonies so we all look the same, and then pretend like we still can be different, or that it won't lead to us failing again. And Melanchthon said, look, we all have to be ready to suffer for the faith, confess with our lives if we have to. And you can't take that away from the gospel. You can't take the sword and the fire that Christ brought the gospel into the world with away without losing the gospel itself. So we have to be ready to stand for this and confess it. And yes, that means the things we do outwardly, which in and of themselves might be indifferent, no longer are. They make a huge difference. I think a connecting thing in everything that you just laid out for us, I really like this question. Does this describe what we look like in our church? That's something that I try to help any congregation that I serve to work through. And I'll actually take my congregations through the Augsburg Confession, through the Formula of Concord, or I have this show and I recommend that they listen to that. But behind all of that then is, does this describe what we confess in our church? Which is ultimately what we mean by, does this describe what our church looks like? Because what we're concerned about is that confession, that faithful confession, which I think hints at something that we talked more about last week, Chaplain Denzer and I did. But I just want to push here as well, just in case someone didn't listen last week, go back and listen if you didn't. But you brought up, you said, does this look like another church? Of course, we want to be careful there because a lot of times thrown at us is, well, you're just doing Roman Catholic things. Well, and that might be true, right? And we talked about that. But again, what we're really concerned with is how does this confess the faith? And that's going to be what we're centered on. And if the Roman Catholics do that, then so be it. They're confessing the faith rightly there when they have scripture readings and sermons and things like that. Uh, Pastor Bean, with just a couple minutes left here, uh, give us your parting thoughts here. Really briefly, we had mentioned the new measures, and a big part of the new measures was music. They used songs that tried to put pressure on people to make a confession for Christ and a decision for Jesus. 
and they didn't use the traditional hymnody of the church. They used music to form psychological pressure. And our forefathers in the Missouri Synod explicitly rejected that and stuck with the historic hymns. And I do think we do see some of that again today with the contemporary worship songs, which are made to appeal to emotion rather than to confess the faith rightly. In the context of the confessions, they were confessing against uh, domination of the Roman Catholic Church in a military sense. But today we need to confess against domination, cultural domination of maybe a Protestantizing element in the church or a sense of decision theology that is alien to our confessions. And so that's the beauty of our Lutheran confessions. They're so robust, they apply at any time in history, whether we're confessing against Rome or whether we're confessing against Geneva or whether we're confessing against the Muslims. The point is, is that we are confessing in what we say and in what we do. And that's always an important thing to remember. Why are we doing what we're doing? Is this truly an adiaphoron, or is this something I need to put my foot down as a matter of confession? And we need to keep that in mind when we consider matters of adiaphora. Absolutely. Well said. You brought in one example, but there's so many other examples that we could certainly talk about here. And maybe we'll leave that for the next show. So actually, Chaplain Denzer, as uh, we depart here, go ahead and give us a preview of what we're going to look at next week. I think we'll do what Pastor Bean was hinting at, what we talked about in some of the other episodes, and that is to look at some of these details, some of these hints, these glimpses of what reality looked like for the confessors. Because admittedly, some parts of the confessions are the technical stuff, the dry stuff, the doctrine uh, that we want to get straight. But like we said, we all get a little lazy. We wonder what it really looked like. So I think we'll look at some of the hints in the confessions, but we'll use that as the stepping off point to look at some sources outside the confessions that describe what worship on a Sunday actually looked like among the reforming Lutherans, to see what this looks like in practice, how the doctrine appears to the average person in the pew, or no pew at those times, in fact. And I think that'll help give us the full picture. Absolutely. I think it'll be great to draw everything together. But thank you, Chaplain Sean Denzer and Pastor Larry Bean, for joining us for Concord Matters today and discussing with us why Concord Matters for Aliyafra or different things in our worship in the Christian church. And thank you also, dear listener, for stopping by today. And until next time, keep confessing, church.